Uh, my name is Lauren. I've been doing payments and banking startups for many years now. Um, and I'm going to be talking about Bitcoin. So the reality is Bitcoin is just another new technology, just like the Internet was 20 years ago. You know, and 20 years ago, a lot of people were standing around asking, well, what's this email thing? And what's that A with the circle around it? Is that a boat? Like, well, no, it's at. And it's, you know, what is Lauren at? Uh, gmail.com mean. So I'm hoping in this uh, workshop to give you guys the language of Bitcoin and give you the skills so that you guys can go out and actually start using it and understanding what it is and be able to tell other people, hey, this is what Bitcoin is. And the first thing I want to talk about is Napster. Do you guys remember Napster? Yeah, it was great. When it first came out, it was like, oh my God, I can get all, these music, all this music and videos for free from all these other people. Um, and you guys remember what happened, eh? It was, went up to 80 million users pretty much in a year or two. And eventually it got shut down in 2001. Had to, had to pay $26 million in fines and they were shut down. And that was it. After they went away, how do we get... Uh, music and videos for free right now. BitTorrents, okay? And that's right. And right now, they, you know, they've, they've been going around since uh, started around 2003. They're still around. It's, it's 11 years later, 10 years later, 150 million active users. Almost half the internet traffic are uh, just files through BitTorrent going through. And the key point here is that it's still active. Why is it still active? What, what is it about BitTorrent that keeps it going, but Napster isn't going? I heard somebody in the back. What did you say? Decentralized. Decentralized. OK. This is how Napster was set up. There was one central website, one central authority that was facilitating the transfers of files. OK? But through BitTorrent, there's no one central point. It's essentially people are sharing files with each other. You know, and, and yes, the whole idea of sharing copyrighted material with each other is illegal, but the key point here is to understand centralized versus decentralized. And a decentralized system, who's the government going to shut down? You know, are they, they going to tell people, hey, God, you, you know, there's just so many people trading with each other? It's easy. With a centralized service, they shut down Napster. The decentralized service, there's no middleman, there's no middle person to shut down. So this is the key part here. Centralized, controlled by one authority. Decentralized, it's essentially controlled by a community. People peer to peer. Let me ask you guys something. Uh, PayPal, a system like PayPal, is that centralized or decentralized? Centralized, excellent. So this whole notion of OK, great, we got decentralization. You know, Bitcoin is a decentralized service. But really, who cares? Let me go down the list. Start off with Argentina. You heard recently they just defaulted on some loans. That's the government defaulted on loans. Since 1989, they've had hyperinflation. So let me give you an example. Last year, their currency, one, US, sorry, one peso, was worth 20 cents US dollar. Right now, it's worth 12 cents, one year later. Can you imagine that bottle of water you want to buy? Last year, it was $1. This year, it's $2. The value of your house goes down by half. You know, and, and what are these Argentinians going to do? You know, they're getting, it's basically their government. Their central authority is printing more money. Another example, Cyprus. You guys remember last year when Cyprus got a bailout from the Eurozone? During that time, the, uh, the Cyprus government froze all bank accounts for two weeks. So like you, you want to get some money to buy some food, want to get some money to, to you know, support your business. You can't. For two weeks, nobody in the country could access their funds. And then after the two weeks, in order to uh, support the Eurozone bailout, in order you know, for the, to get the bailout, the, uh, the Cyprus government said, OK, anybody who has a bank account with more than 100,000 euros in it, we're taxing it 40%. Just like that, the government takes out 40% of your money. 
And then, of course, the two and a half billion people that don't have the luxury that we have here in the Western world of being banked, having a bank account. You know, many of these people are in countries where their, their governments are corrupt, the financial institutions are corrupt, they can't trust anybody but the people they know in their community. And you think that's in third world countries or second world countries, well, here at home, there's actually about 8% of Americans who don't have the ability to get a bank account. You know, maybe they, they don't have the proper paperwork, or even 20% of Americans don't have access to credit. You know, they, they've had a bankruptcy in the past, they have poor credit, they're not able to get a credit card or a bank loan. Go down the list, startups innovating. So generally, if you're a startup and you want to do, provide some sort of innovative finan financial service, well, you have to partner up with a bank or you have to partner up with some company that is plugged into the credit card network. All these companies, they provide um, authorization. You know, they want to check to make sure, yeah, okay, it's cool you're innovating, but you have to follow these rules. And if you don't follow these rules, well, sorry, we can't help you. Let's go down the list. PayPal users. Most people here, I'm assuming, have PayPal accounts. Well, I'm for one of them. I got my account frozen. Happens all the time. People get their accounts frozen. If they're, you know, one time I was running an event. In one week, I made $10,000. And that just looked different from, from the normal events that I put on. And what they do? Well, they said, oh, looks suspicious. We're freezing your account. Please send us your bank statements. Please send us your utility bills. We want to make sure you are who you say you are. Took a month to get the money. Another example. So I'm a Canadian. I have a Canadian credit card, and I'm here in the U.S. Every time I spend my uh, money with a Canadian credit card, my bank charges me 5%. You know why? Well, it's an exchange fee. That's what they tell me, but what the real reason is, oh, it's another excuse for them to charge me more money. You know, it's bad enough that, that uh, the government charges me taxes. Now I'm losing another 5% of my money because the bank has a reason to charge me. Another centralized service. So these are all examples of centralized services where you know, the people using them, they have no choice. Like, well, what do you do if you're in Argentina? There isn't really much you can do until now. That's why Bitcoin is so valuable, because it's decentralized. Most people are familiar with this. It looks like a ledger if you've ever had a bank book. You know, if you ever looked at your... Uh, your accounting for your PayPal account, your bank account, you see something like this, a ledger. You know, I input $50,000, maybe I spent some money, $5,000 on something, and it's just a list of transactions. That's just a simple ledger. And with the centralized service like PayPal, ledgers are great because they, they solve the double spend problem. So let's say I have a dollar in PayPal credits, and I come up to AJ over here, and I say, hey, AJ, can I buy that bottle of water? Here's a PayPal credit. Here's a dollar in PayPal credits. And then I turn around and, and say, Steve, hey, Steve, can I buy that bottle of water? I've got a, a dollar in PayPal credits, too, but really only have one PayPal credit. How, how do these guys know, you know that they're actually getting my one dollar? Well, that's why you have the ledger. You know, it keeps track of everyone's balances, keeps track of all the money. And it's in a centralized service like this, like in PayPal, it's great. It works great because there's one central authority saying, well, no, Lauren, you only have one dollar. You already gave that to AJ. I'm sorry, Lauren, you can't give that dollar to Steve. That works really well in a centralized service. But how does it work in a decentralized service if there's no one central authority to keep track of everyone's money? So this is the big innovation with Bitcoin, and it's called the blockchain, okay? So here you have all these different people that are using Bitcoin. They're trading money with each other. And see all these green squares with the L on them? Those are Bitcoin miners. There's tens of thousands of computers around the world that all have a copy of the updated ledger of Bitcoin. And, you know, how do you add more transactions to that ledger? Well, there's a special process to it. 
what's going on is all these miners, they all have the last, you know, the last copy of every transaction in the ledger, and they're all working really hard. They're putting in tons of processing power to solve a, a very difficult mathematical equation. And when one of them solves that mathematical equation, they say out to the network, hey guys, I solved that equation, which in return for solving that, that mathematical problem, they're rewarded with money. They're rewarded with Bitcoin for solving that problem. And also, that miner who solves the problem gets to add in a new block, a new block of transactions. Generally, it's about you know, two, 300, 500 transactions in that one block. And just so you guys know, OK, and, and once they discover that new block, then they push it out to the rest of the network and then say to everybody else, hey guys, here's the new block of transactions. I'm adding it to the ledger. And then everybody else in the network, all the other miners, update their ledger. They all update their copy. OK, so that, that's the, the blockchain in a nice, simple format of how it works. And the key part here is everyone is up to date with the ledger, you know, a ledger that we can trust. It's nice enough that I can show you an example of how the ledger works, but let me show you guys in real life the ledger, the blockchain itself. So this website here shows in real time every single Bitcoin transaction that's taken place since the very first one in 2009. Okay? And about, let me, let me actually refresh the page here. You can see here about 22 minutes ago, this person here, Discuss Fish, discovered a new block. And inside that new block is 193 transactions. And if I click on the block, I can actually see the list of every single transaction in that block. You can see that well, there's 200 of them, so I won't go through each one. But I'll just pick one at random. This one here, somebody sent $810 to another person. And all these Bitcoin addresses are the identities of where the money went from to who it went to. OK? Uh, and what I'm going to do now is show you guys an example of a, simp of a transaction. I have two Bitcoin wallets. And I'm just going to transfer money from one Bitcoin wallet to another. So here I have a wallet with Coinbase, and here I have a wallet with um, blockchain.info. These are what my wallets look like. In this wallet, I have about $9. You can see there. And uh, I'm going to send some money. And I want to send it to this wallet. Now, I'll explain what all these random characters mean later. Um, let's say I want to send $1. $1.25. Okay. We just go next and send. And you're going to hear a beep real soon. There you go. I don't know if you guys just saw that it, it went from $0.04 cents to $1.29 instantly. That's how fast a Bitcoin transaction can look. Sort of. Okay, Johan's shaking his head. Uh, so it's pushed out to the network. I've pushed my transaction out to the network. But now we have to wait if, you know, about 10 minutes or 20 minutes, however long it takes, for a Bitcoin miner to discover a new block and include my transaction in that block. Once my transaction's in that block, then it's as good as gold. Well, sort of. You can wait a few more just in case. But uh, that's, that's the general process of how um, a Bitcoin, Bitcoin transactions work. So I did that. Now, a lot of people might ask, well, who are these Bitcoin miners? Why are, they, why are they providing all this processing power for this network? What's in it for them? So I always equate Bitcoin miners of today, like the guy on the right here, to Bitcoin miners of 200 years ago during the gold rush. You know, they're all investing a lot of money up front, and they're going out and, and doing some hard work just to find a little bit of gold. So the Bitcoin miners of today, the tools that they use are actually big servers. You know, just like standing around next to the guy over here. He's got racks of servers, 
And all those servers are providing infrastructure for, for the Bitcoin world, for the network. And occasionally, the more processing power they put into the network, the greater the chance they have of uh, getting that 25 Bitcoin reward. You know, it's about every 10 minutes, a new Bitcoin miner is rewarded with 25 Bitcoin, which is about $15,000 in today's terms. <laughs> uh, and there's a set schedule. So right now, there's about 13 million Bitcoin released in the world. By 2140, there will be 21 million Bitcoin released into the world. And after that, that's it. No more Bitcoin is released in the world. So just like there's gold, there's only a static amount of gold in the world right now, you know, somewhere in the ground, all over the place. It'll be the same thing with Bitcoin. Now, the big difference between Bitcoin miners of today versus the miners of 200 years ago is the miners today have another revenue stream, which is called a miner fee. So think of it as um, if you want to send a package through FedEx, and you can either have your package arrive in seven days, or if it's high priority, you can have it arrive tomorrow. So you pay a little extra fee to have it arrive tomorrow. Same thing with Bitcoin miners. If I want my transaction to be included in the very next block, I can pay a priority fee to make sure it gets put in there. Otherwise, there's no guarantees it might be put in the next block or five blocks from now, 10 blocks from now. You don't know. So a Bitcoin wallet. There's two questions you need to ask with any Bitcoin wallet. One is what is my Bitcoin address? Okay, and two, where is my private key stored? So I always equate Bitcoin wallets to having an email account. Okay, so with an email, with an email account, there's two things you want to know. What's my email address, right? So people can send me emails. And two, what's my password to get into my email account, right? And only that one person who has the password can get access to this email account and send out emails. So Bitcoin address looks like this. You know, it's just a random string of characters that doesn't really mean anything. Uh, and sometimes it's represented as a QR code. Now, it's important to know that because if you want people to send you money, you give them your Bitcoin address, just like if you want them to send you an email, you give them your email address. Now, where is my private key stored? So this is an example of what a private key looks like. And you need that to, um, to be able to push money out. If you want to send money to somebody, you need to somehow have that private key. And there's two types of wallets that you can use to send money or receive money or store your money. There's a, a wallet provider like Coinbase. And with them, their whole purpose is they're trying to make it as easy as possible for people. And they hold on to your private keys for you. You never need to touch your private keys. They hold on to it for you, and it's just like PayPal. You create an account, you connect it to your bank account, and you're all set up. You're good to go. With blockchain, uh, they, instead, they give you the tools. They give you the tools to hold on to your private keys they give you the tools to generate a new Bitcoin address. So the, really, the difference between the two comes down to trust. Whoever has those private keys has access to the, to the account. Okay? Now, do you trust Coinbase to hold on to your private keys for you? Or do you trust yourself to hold on to the private keys yourself? And that's a decision that each person needs to make. So just like with the internet, Bitcoin is a new technology. And with new technologies come a lot of mistakes. So I'm going to show you this video of what not to do. You have a couple of boys, and I brought a little Christmas present for them. Thank you. These are uh, little Bitcoin wallets, and mm, you give them to the kids. Kid, and uh, well, I figure they're what five years old, so old enough to work a computer and probably understand more than we do about they Bitcoin. Do. Uh, this is the public key of the wallet. Now inside this, you can see if you unwrap these little Christmas wallets from uh, 
from it's laser a private beam. Key. Don't, no, 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 don't, don't unwrap it. Let me show you what happened on Friday on Street Smart. Roll the tape. Oh, Adam, yeah. here you You're go. Is Bitcoin? Trish. Wow. Here you go. No way. You'll find a private key on the inside. Oh wow. That. Uh, you can access and load into your wallet that you have if you have a blockchain wallet or a Coinbase wallet or whatever uh, so you've got. This is what I put on my phone so that when exactly. I, so that when <laughs> okay, I pause it here right now. Somebody was laughing. Tell me why are you laughing? <laughs> private key. Okay, and what happens when he shows his private key? That's right. Okay, so let's see what happens. And uh, I want to go buy or or sell or whatever. I put this up on the computer. Exactly. The computer reads it, knows to debit my account because my account that's my account. That's right. And that's basically the PIN number to his account. So what we learned on Friday, and this has been an incredible learning experience for me. It's been so much fun, but sometimes a little bit costly. Is that you don't ever show that public key. The inside QR code from these. This is basically like a twenty dollar bill. Except for in Bitcoin form, the inside is the is the pin code, and some uh, guy from Reddit called Milky Way Master. Milky Way Master. He, no he E R froze, A H. He froze that uh, a high def picture of the QR code and just ganked, as we say in uh, ghetto slang. He ganked that twenty dollars worth uh, of Bitcoin off of Adam's wallet there. Now, I told him. You know, great lesson in Bitcoin security. Merry Christmas. You keep that twenty dollars as a really? tip. Really? Well, here's my merry. Okay. And then she goes off on a tangent. But uh, anyways, the reason I show you that is because I'm I'm showing you guys how to use a Bitcoin wallet, and I want to make sure you guys don't do what they did. <laughs> great. Now you know what a wallet is. Now you know how to get set up. What can you guys do with Bitcoin? Well, there's there's some really cool Bitcoin startups out there. That are providing some really unique services. So, uh, kind of like the lending network, there's a BTC Jam, and they provide peer-to-peer -peer lending of Bitcoin. So, if you have some extra money lying around, you can make some pretty good interest by lending your Bitcoin to other people. Thirty-seven coins. They're actually sitting in the back there, and so they're they're actually. Remember, I spoke about the two and a half billion that are unbanked. They're bringing Bitcoin. They're bringing a banking solution to those people through SMS. Purse.io. Anybody here shop on Amazon? Yeah, Elliot in the back. Uh, I'm sure all of you guys do. I, I, I love shopping on Amazon. Well, what if I told you if you paid with Bitcoin, you could get at least 30% or 15, 15 to 30 percent. Elliot, I know, bought something, got. To, 30% off a GoPro, just by, just by paying with Bitcoin. And of course, GoGo coins. So these are Bitcoin gift cards. Make it really easy to give gift, uh, Bitcoin to people through a gift card. And I think we're going to be giving out some of those later today. So now that you guys are all itching to get some Bitcoin, you're probably asking, where can I get some Bitcoin? Well, the first place is that Bitcoin ATM in the back over there. Um, so any Bitcoin ATM, there's many of them popping up around the world. I'll actually be heading to the Philippines, and there's a Bitcoin ATM there. I might just, instead of spending my Canadian credit card down there and getting charged 5%, I'll just put my money into Bitcoin and get it out in uh, Filipino pesos. Uh, local Bitcoin. So th this is a service where you meet up with other people at a coffee shop, kind of like on Craigslist. And instead of swapping, you know, like a computer or whatever, you, you give them cash for Bitcoin. So that, that's another way of getting Bitcoin. And of course, Coinbase, it's similar to PayPal where you go, you sign up, and you connect to your bank account. And you can purchase Bitcoin through your bank account. Uh, so that's it. I hope you guys uh, enjoyed it and you feel confident and understand how to go out and get Bitcoin and start spending it. Well, thank you.